Well, good morning. Um, it's really, really nice to, uh, to, be, to be speaking to you. Um, I'm going to do a few things this morning. I thought it might be it, the right place to start might be to just tell you who I am and why I'm here. Um, my involvement with PHP dates back to 1997, actually. Uh, so at that point in time, I was working as a professor in a university in Australia. That's where the accent's from, though I live in California. Um, and I was teaching a graduate program all about the web. And I thought, we need a teaching language. And this new thing, PHP, had appeared. I thought this was kind of interesting, and so I kind of adopted it as, uh, as a teaching language in a, in a graduate uh, course. Um, that caused me, rather foolishly, um, to write a book. Um, I would not recommend writing a book. Um, it's about 1% inspiration, about 99% perspiration, and it's very, very lonely. Um, I was very surprised, though, when I wrote this book that it sold. So uh, lots of people bought it. That was kind of surprising. Um, I was also very pleased with the book because it had a platypus on the cover, and being Australian, I was, I was quite thrilled with that. I can tell you the backstory behind that. I lobbied, uh, I lobbied O'Reilly very, very hard that I wanted a platypus on the cover. I, I tried to make arguments about sort of the lamp stack and said, well, it's kind of like a platypus. It's a duck's bill glued onto a beaver's body with this strange tail. Come on, you know, let me put the platypus on there. And O'Reilly only has one principle, really, when they work with authors, which is don't put pressure on us to choose the cover. Um, so it was a tense negotiation. I kind of won the negotiation. The platypus ended up on the cover. The book sold a few copies. Um, I then made another crucial mistake, which was help out with another book. Um, in this particular book, I just contributed a couple of chapters, again, uh, on, on PHP. Um, I then got really, really overexcited and wrote another book. Um, at this point in time, I was really regretting it. Uh, I had two young children. I was writing it in my parents' Winnebago, sitting out in the yard, trying to avoid the children, write the book. It was not a lot of fun. It didn't sell particularly well. Maybe it was the, the kids and the time. I'm not really sure. Um, and then I came back and uh, uh, improved the first book I wrote. Um, and you'll notice here that this, uh, this second edition of, uh, of, of my first book has a very angry platypus on the cover. Um, <laughs> I think this is O'Reilly's way of telling me, uh, don't put pressure on us about the covers. Um, so that's me. That, that's my history in PHP. Um, much of the rest of the time today, though, I'm going to spend telling you about uh, eBay and what we do at eBay. Uh, I'm going to touch in the, in the middle on something that may be of um, specific interest to you as, uh, as, as PHP developers. But, but by and large, it's a, it's a broad tour of eBay. Um, so I wanted to start really just by uh, telling you uh, a little bit about the the history of the company. Um, so like many startups, um, uh, eBay got kind of started by, by a couple of guys. Pierre Midjar is our, is our founder. Uh, he built this page in 1995. This is the very original uh, homepage of eBay. Uh, it was at that point in time called Auction Web. There's a very, very small uh, circled piece of uh, text there in the middle. It's hard to read up the back perhaps, but it says there are always several hundred auctions underway. Um, so you're bound to find something interesting. So very, very humble beginnings for what's now a, uh, a, a very, very large company, but one that still connects um, buyers with sellers. Um, these days, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a very large enterprise. Uh, we sell a car around every 1.6 minutes. Uh, we sell a GPS device uh, every minute. And my favorite statistic, because I sold some shoes on eBay last week, is we sell a, a pair of shoes every seven seconds. Uh, somebody bought my old, uh, my old boots. Uh, so I was thrilled to, thrilled to package them up and send them to somebody. We, we sell a lot of stuff. Um, uh, in 2010, we sold $62 billion of, of merchandise through eBay.com. And that's, that's all, the, all the, the family of sites uh, across the world, including the, the, the UK site, the German site, the Australian site, and so on. Um, last year, that rose to $68.6 billion uh, in merchandise. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very large website um, indeed. Let me tell you about the data that that generates. This is really sort of getting into the, into the core of what I, what I wanted to talk to you about today. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the data and what we, what we do with that data, and then I'm going to move on and tell you a little bit about some of our, some of our key platforms. And then at the end, if we've got a little bit of time, I'll, I'll, I'll speculate about the future of, uh, of commerce online, um, and then we'll hopefully have a little bit of time for some, for some questions before I race out the door and jump on an aircraft. Back to California. So here's some amazing statistics. Um, this, is, this is the kind of thing that keeps uh, a, a vice president of engineering uh, on his toes and 
uh, with a phone by the bed at night. Um, we have uh, 100, uh, more than 100 million uh, active users uh, using the eBay marketplace. Um, our search engine gets around 250 million queries um, per day. It depends on the day of the week. It depends on the seasonality of the year, but, uh, but it's always a very, very large number. Uh, and at any, at any point in time, we have over 300 uh, million listings, active listings on the site of, of uh, sellers um, making offers uh, to, to buyers. Um, we also have an enormous archive of data, so we keep, we keep listings that have sold and we make those available to search. So typically we're serving um, through our search engine over a billion listings um, at, any, at any point in time. So there's some statistics. These ones amaze me even more. Um, we are sitting on top of nine petabytes of data. It's a little over nine petabytes of data now um, in two large sort of data management installations. We have a Teradata installation, a uh, commercial system, a sort of data warehousing system that we use primarily for financial applications. And then we have a very large Hadoop installation that all of our engineers use to understand the customers, understand behaviors of those customers, and use to, to build features on the site. And I'm going to tell you in a moment a little bit about some of the things we use Hadoop for um, in, our, in our engineering team. But, but an enormous amount of data. Uh, I mentioned this statistic yesterday on the panel. Uh, every, every day we serve around 2 billion page requests for our, for our view item pages. Um, so very, very high performance. Uh, uh, web serving system, and uh, all that put together makes around 75 billion uh, database calls per day. Um, I hinted yesterday on the panel, if you were here, that uh, you know there's there's interesting trade-offs between having a highly normalized database and doing lots of joins, and having a very flat database where the joins are pre-computed. We're certainly at the at the joins are pre-computed, very flat database end, and so we make an enormous amount of database calls to uh, to satisfy uh, our, our customers. So very, very big, uh, big operation indeed. So let me now sort of turn to the, the kind of the meat of the talk and talk a little bit about um, how do we use this data um, to build better products um, at eBay. I'll tell you three stories. So story number one. Let me tell you a little bit about what we call query rewrites. Um, so if I look back in the history of eBay and I look at the search engine that we have, um, it, it, it was a very, very literal search engine. So and what I mean by that is that our search engine took the keywords that you provided as a, as a customer as search terms and very literally matched those exactly to the titles of the items that were on eBay. Um, that, you know, that, that, that sort of precision is, 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 is good in some sense, but it's also problematic in other senses. So for example, if a seller makes a small mistake in their title, they, uh, they misspell a word, um, for example, you know, perhaps they're listing their old Palm Pilot, they pull it out of the drawer, take a photo of it, and accidentally list it as a Plan Pilot, um, then you know, those buyers who are searching for Palm Pilots are not going to match against that item that's a Plan Pilot. And that seller's probably going to be disappointed. Um, they're not gonna, they're not, their item's not going to be shown to the users who are, who are demanding that product and they're probably not going to achieve the price that they were hoping to achieve. There's also all sorts of other more obvious problems. So problems with plurals, for example. Um, you know, if you, if you add or omit an S in English, um, you know, it could, make a, it could make a huge difference as to how many results are returned and whether all the relevant results are returned. So we're now on a journey to make our search engine much more intuitive. Um, and um, what we're really trying to do is to, is to do a good job of understanding the intent of the user's query and not be so literal about matching the user's query to the title of the items. So here's the idea. Um, we have an extreme amount of data. Um, you know, when you're getting 250 million queries per day, when you're serving up 2 billion pages per day, and you're logging all that information, you, you have an extreme amount of data. Um, the idea is to take that data mine that data, look for patterns, you know, create understanding from that data, and then, um, and then use that to better map users' literal queries to the real intent that the, that the users have. I've sort of drawn that pictorial. I'll give you, I'll give you an example in a moment. But, but the idea is this, uh, this user here poses a query. We take that query. We kind of pre-process that query. We rewrite the query, we, we, we uh, perhaps add words to the query, perhaps remove words from the query, and then we run that query behind the scenes on our search engine and show the user uh, what are hopefully 
more relevant results than those that were literally expressed by the user's original query. Um, we do it in a couple of different ways. I'll give you examples in a moment. You know, one way is sort of taking words and, and creating synonyms for those words. And I use synonym in a, in a very loose sense. Uh, the other way is, is using the structure of eBay in a more intuitive way. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, again in a moment. So here's the, uh, here's the first example. Um, you might wonder, what is this thing? Um, I can tell you this is a, and, I, and, I, and my German is terrible, this is a Pils lamp, uh, which in English apparently means mushroom lamp. Um, and they're quite popular on eBay. It may be, may be surprising to you. Uh, particularly on the German site, so if you're at ebay.de and you search for Pils lamp, you will find uh, lots of these, uh, lots of these uh, mushroom lamps. So, what happens um, if, a, if a user uh, types uh, Pils lamp as a, as a single term? Well, they'll get a, they'll get a set of results that literally match that. But behind the scenes, from, from understanding our extreme data, we can, we can deduce a, a number of facts that can help the user retrieve more relevant results. So for example, we can learn that Pils lamp as a sort of conflated term is actually equivalent to pills and lamp with a space between them. Uh, how, might we, how might we learn that from our extreme data? It's pretty simple, really. Um, lots of users are out there typing the, the conflated term, getting a set of results and interacting with those results, and then very soon after, typing pills, space, lamp, getting a set of results and interacting with those results. And when you're logging all of that and when you're seeing that pattern at a very large scale, you can deduce that the conflated term and the term with a space are probably equivalent. It doesn't always work. So while, that, while that sounds like a pretty intuitive, um, sensible, kind of naive idea, it doesn't always work. I'll give you, I'll give you an American-centric uh, example. So uh, users come along looking for, for memorabilia related to, to colleges or universities uh, in the United States. Um, a very famous college in the, in the States is, uh, is CMU. Um, which to most Americans, you know, 99% of Americans means Carnegie Mellon University. But let's imagine I went to Central Michigan University, a much, much smaller university, a much less, less known university. What I'm probably going to do is I'm going to come to eBay, I'm going to type CMU, I'm going to say, oh, this isn't at all what I wanted. I'm being flooded with Carnegie Mellon results. Let me try typing another query, Central space Michigan space University. Oh, I'm much happier now and I'm interacting with the results. Lots of users do that. You might form the wrong conclusion that CMU and Carnegie Mel and uh, Central Michigan University, excuse me, are the same, which they're not to 99% of the users. So there's lots of little subtle edge cases that make this a, make this a very, very complex problem. But nonetheless, the, 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 idea, is, the idea is simple and right. You can also learn that, that Pils and Pilsa are the same. You can also learn that, that Lampa and Lampen are the same. And if you know all of that, when a user comes along and types pills lamp, you can run a much more complex query behind the scenes and hopefully deliver more relevant results. It's a little hard to see probably up the back here, but you can see a, a very long query that, um, that our search engine would actually run. And it's, a, it's an or query between the original uh, user's query, the pills lamp, and a, and a long expression that's a phrasal expression, which says pills or pilsa um, or lamp or lampen. So that deals with the, with the space between them and all the alternative um, expressions of, of, of the same meaning. So it's a pretty intuitive idea. We do this at a very large scale, and we do this based on the extreme data that we have in our Hadoop cluster. Let me give you one more example. If you, if you came to eBay historically and you typed uh, Bermuda stamps, um, you'd probably be disappointed because you only found, as shown on the left here, around 300 results. What's happened uh, here is that uh, the search engine has very literally matched the word Bermuda against seller titles and the word stamps against seller titles. And so the only results that are returned are those that contain Bermuda and stamps in the title. But if we, if again, if we've mined our data, we'll very quickly learn that there are great results for Bermuda stamps if you simply type Bermuda and then navigate to the stamps category. So rather than doing a literal match of the, of the text stamps against the title, just do a literal match of Bermuda against the title and then restrict to the stamps category. 
Again, you can learn this from, from our extreme data. You'll, you'll see customers doing it. You'll see customers typing Bermuda stamps, being disappointed, not interacting with the engine, typing Bermuda and refining to the stamps category. And you can derive that those things are, are similar. Again, lots of nuances, lots of little subtleties of, of getting that right, but the idea is pretty intuitive and it turns out to work really well. Um, in this particular case, the user would get over 3,000 results instead of the 300 results if we were much more literal in our matches. So it works really well. Let me tell you another story. So I've got three stories about, uh, uh, about data. Um, so search at, at, the, at the eBay scale is a, is, is a very challenging problem. Um, I, I think of it in a, in a number of ways from the, from the applied science side, but, but, um, but let, me, let me walk you through a simple way of thinking about it. What we have in our extreme data is all sorts of information that could help us deliver great results for customers. And I like to think of those, that information in kind of five buckets. So first of all, there's textual information. There's words in titles, there's words in descriptions, there's information that might be associated with an item that tells you what category that, that item's in, there might be tags that the seller's provided, but all sorts of useful textual information that you can match from the user's item to, the user, to, uh, to another user's query. So lots of, lots of useful information there. There's also great, great information you can learn from the images. Um, it turns out that users love to, to click on items that have a pleasing aspect ratio. So users like that 4-3 that, that television ratio, they like that 16-9 television ratio, they like images with a clean background, they like high quality photography. They're more likely, in general, to click on images that, that, that have those characteristics. So again, you can use those factors in making sure you're delivering the best possible results to, to customers. There's a third bucket, and that's knowledge of the seller. So if you know something about where the seller is located, if the seller is located near the buyer, you know, perhaps that, that's useful in ranking results for that buyer. If you know that the, the seller has an impeccable record with shipping, they're very responsive with their email, lots of other factors, again, very useful in, in ranking results um, for, for buyers. There's also lots of information you can learn about the buyer. You can learn whether the buyer likes auctions, whether the buyer likes fixed price, whether the buyer likes free shipping. You know, all sorts of preferences that, 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 uh, around categories, uh, all kinds of information that you can learn. And then most importantly, in this sort of getting to the point of, uh, of the next couple of slides, there's also lots of behavioral information generated by customers using the site. So for example, you might speculate that an item that's that's been watched by many users is perhaps more relevant than, than one that's been watched less. If, if users are making an offer to buy an item, perhaps it's more relevant than an item with no offers. Perhaps an item that's clicked on frequently in the search results is more relevant than an item that isn't. But there's all sorts of behavioral information generated that could be useful in, in, in search ranking at eBay. So I think a lot about these kind of five buckets of factors. Um, a problem though emerges when you get so excited about five buckets of factors and all sorts of different, different sort of uh, you know, pieces of information that you could derive to, to work on the ranking problem. And that is that you need some way to combine those factors to compute a ranking score to order the results for the customer's query. And you can't do that as a human. You, you can't sit down and tune constants to come up with a, with a large ranking function that, that'll work for, for users. You need some other way to combine those factors to come up with a, with a, with a function. Um, I was here for, for Ian Barber's talk yesterday. He talked a little bit about SVMs uh, as, a, as a learning technique. Um, we use those kinds of approaches at scale, where we take a training set of data, and we, it's labeled with things that are relevant and things that are irrelevant, and we, uh, we use a machine learning approach to combine factors um, to, to deliver the best results for our customers. So that's kind of ranking at, 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 at scale. So let me get to the point of this, um, of this particular um, factor in using our data. So this thing uh, called item quality is one of tens of factors that we use, in our, we use in our ranking function. And the idea is pretty simple. What we're trying to do is using our, using our extreme data is compute for any new item that's listed on eBay, what's the likelihood that it will sell and what price might it sell for? In many cases, that's a reasonably easy problem. If somebody's listing, listing a brand new 
new in season, sixth generation iPod Nano, new in its box, it's pretty easy to work out whether or not it'll sell at the price that the customer's provided. It's a much more challenging problem when a user lists uh, something that's one-off. So I'm sure, I'm sure our algorithms, for example, had trouble uh, estimating whether or not my used uh, boots would sell and for what price they might sell. But nonetheless, um, we, we worked very hard on this problem and we, we, do a, we do a pretty good job of it. So, based on, our, based on our historical data, using our dupe cluster, we can, we can compute for any item that's listed on the site, its likelihood of sale and the likely price that it'll sell for. And then we can use that in ranking. But as soon as it really is listed on the site, customers begin to interact with it and we get much richer information. So as time passes by, and I've sort of done that on the, drawn that on the x-axis here, as time passes by, we put less and less reliance on, in our ranking on what we've pre-computed when the seller listed it, and we put more and more emphasis on how the buyers are interacting with it. So again, if, if buyers are bidding, offering, watching, asking sellers questions, clicking, viewing, those kinds of things, we're beginning to build up a story about whether that item is interesting. And by the time it's, by the, by the time it's uh, if it's an auction, by the time it's, a, it's, about to, it's about to complete, we're almost entirely depending in our ranking function on the information that the buyers have given us. And we've almost completely retired our pre-estimation that we made uh, when the item was first listed. So that's just one factor in, in the tens of factors that, that go into our ranking function. You can imagine if you worked on the applied science team, You'd think this was a pretty intuitive idea, you'd have worked on this for a while, and you'd be pretty excited to get it out to the site. But at our scale, um, everything that seems intuitive and seems easy turns out to be a hard engineering problem. And I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about this particular factor and its journey um, into our ranking function on the site. So we have typically over 6 million item updates per hour. So that's things like bids, offers, revisions of descriptions, people adding additional photographs, answering questions, all those kinds of things. A rate of about six million an hour. And you would need to process these events um, if you were going to accurately compute the behavioral side of this item quality factor. These events are generated on individual machines. We have a large farm of thousands of machines. These, these events are generated on individual machines. Um, the individual machines create uh, logging events. Those events are sort of put out onto a bus and there's a cluster of machines that's listening to that bus, uh, watching for interesting events. It's collecting those events. It's then partitioning those events by item ID. So we're getting all of the events for an item on a particular machine. Then we have, to, we have to sort those so that they can be collated together so that we can do some computation of what's the, what's the meaning from those behaviors. And once we've done that, then we need to decide how interesting is that set of behaviors. Because we have such a large queue of behaviors to process that we need to make sure that we put the most interesting behaviors at the front of the queue. So then sort of a priority queuing exercise going on and then we're consuming that queue into our ranking function and updating the statistics about the items so that we can correctly compute the ranks. So big engineering project. You know, nice intuitive idea from the, from the search science team. It, it works really well, but big engineering effort from our search infrastructure team to really get it to scale at pra in practice. Um, so it's a long journey when you're working on tens of factors in search to go from an intuitive idea based on data to an idea that's in production that's running at the scale that, that, that we need for our customers. I'm going to come back and talk about search a little bit, a little bit more later on. I want to tell you a little bit more about the search platform and where that's at too. So last, last story about uh, the data of eBay. Um, if you've got as much data as we have, you really need tools to be able to sort of visualize and understand that data. And I've listed up here some, some examples of of tools and, and uh, techniques that we have available to us to, um, to work with our data. I'll just dive in and tell you, about, tell you about two of them. So we have a tool that we call the heat map tool and allows us to visualize the performance of a query. Um, the query that you're looking at here is the query metal detectors. And what you can see is our search results page and over that has been superimposed a heat map um, that can be uh, red, yellow or green or shades in between. In this case, it's, it's reasonably green. Um, 
What that means to me as somebody who's looked at lots of these is that this query is performing roughly as expected. I can see a couple of little nuances in this query that might, that might concern me that I might want to go and investigate. So for example, I can see that the second result is getting about 1% of the, of the clicks that go to the page, while the first result's only getting uh, 0.73 of the clicks that go to the page. Normally I would expect to see the first result getting more, more clicks than the second result, and you'll typically see a kind of exponential decay in the, in the click curve as you move down the results. So I'm a little bit interested in that. Um, diving into it a little bit more, I can see that the second result is a fixed price item, and I can see that the first result is an auction item. And so maybe I want to go and understand how our rank ranking function is bringing together auctions and fixed price for this particular query metal detectors. But otherwise, this looks like a pretty typical query, and I'd probably move on and, uh, and, and look at another case. Here's one. So this query, um, and the colors aren't, aren't reproducing very well on, up here on the screen, uh, but what, you, what, you, what you'll see here is this is quite red, and the search box at the top is quite red. Um, so visually what this is telling me is that there's something interesting going on with this query. Um, this query is the query Apple. The good news is that lots of users are clicking on our, our product uh, results. So we've got these really nice product results that bring together a summary of all items that, uh, that, that, that match uh, a particular product. And you can see here that over 1.5% of our users are going in and learning about the Apple MacBook uh, laptop. And that's great. Um, really high percentages on, on some of those other results. So a user with the intent Apple seems to like the results that we're presenting. So that's the good part of the story. The concerning part of the story is that over 5% of the clicks are going to the navigation. So there's lots of users who are coming here and saying, oh, I'm not seeing what I want. Let me try refining using navigation. And at the top, you can see 6.5% of the users are going back to the search box and trying a different query. Um, which means that you know, we're, we're not meeting their intent either. So in, you know, in total, maybe 11% of the clicks going to the page are going to a place that's suggesting the results we're delivering aren't the right results. So what we might do as a team with this data is we might decide to go and look at other broad queries in a similar class, those that are showing our product uh, details. We might try and sort of derive a theme of work that we might, that we might go and address to improve search, spin up some new projects, you know, work on those and work on this class of queries. But lots of engineers, lots of product managers at eBay are sitting around looking at these kinds of tools, trying to understand what's going on at scale, and then working to improve um, the search experience. I'll show you one more thing from our data. Um, if, you, if you ever come to, to eBay um, in, in Campbell, which is in the South Bay of uh, California, uh, and you walk around our buildings, you'll see there's large monitors in, in most of the buildings on most of the floors. And what these monitors do all day long is show you sort of interesting things that are happening on the site, graphs, um, visualizations, and very frequently, feedback from our users. So I took this screenshot from one, of our, from one of our consoles, and what you can see here is that a user's decided to give us some feedback. You'll see throughout eBay, there's a link that says, tell us what you think. You can type text in, you can rate us. That goes into a system. We do some automatic tagging of that data. Um, that data gets used by product managers to plan for the product, and it also goes up on these screens that are uh, all, around the, all around the buildings. So in this particular case, um, We've captured the fact that the user was looking at this iPhone 4S deal on eBay as part of our daily deals. And uh, if we knew something about the buyer, we'd, we'd have some statistics about this buyer, whether they're a frequent buyer, how much they're spending on eBay, some, some, some uh, information that might help us kind of characterize um, the, the problem the buyer's having. And then at the top, you can see that uh, this user's quite rightly unhappy that we're not, uh, we're not shipping to Puerto Rico, uh, which is a US, US protectorate. And he's saying, hey, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's much closer than shipping it right across the continental US. Come on, you should be shipping to Puerto Rico. So if I saw this kind of data uh, up on the screen in the kiosk, you know, I could go and see our business team. We could talk about that and we could try to address the, the problem that this particular user is having. So we try very hard at eBay to kind of live in our data. You can, you can see that story. Lots of tools, lots of data, lots of visualization that helps us really work to improve the product. Okay. So, uh, so that's a little bit about eBay, a little bit about data, and I want to just spend a little bit more time talking about platforms at eBay. And then, as I said, if we get a little bit of time at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the future of online commerce and speculate a little. Um, so let me start by telling you about what I think is the most exciting uh, endeavor we're undertaking at eBay right now. It's a project called Cassini. 
Um, to understand it, I just to understand what Cassini is, I just need to give you a little bit of a history lesson. Um, so we have a search engine. Uh, its its name is Voyager. It is still running on the site. It's supporting all of our users right now, and uh, it's been doing so since about 2002. Um, it was named after the Voyager uh, satellite, which I think, if my memory is right, was launched in 1976. Um, there's Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Again, if my memory is right, I think they're both still working. Uh, they've left the solar system. Um, they're still sending back information. They were good, robust satellites for their time, and they're still reliable workhorses. Um, but they are old technology. And that's a little bit like uh, our, our search engine. It's a reliable, critical, proven workhorse, a little bit like a 1976 satellite, um, but it's old. Um, its design is kind of circa 2002, and so it's missed out on a lot of the architectural fundamental advances that have happened in search since 2002. Um, it has very basic ranking functionality, so a lot of the things that the search science team dreams about doing at eBay are very, very difficult to do uh, on top of the Voyager platform. It has title only match by default, so that means it's only matching user queries against the user titles. It's not making really great use of all that descriptive information that the sellers are providing us. And it has a very literal search. Uh, it, it does have some improvements based on the query rewrite uh, ideas I, I told you earlier, but it's, it's very literal relative to, to many modern search engines. It's inflexible and, 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 and most painfully to me as, a, as an engineering guy, it's very manual. So my, my engineers in the search backend team spend an enormous amount of time rolling out code, diagnosing faults, remediating problems, um, imaging machines, making changes to configurations of machines as we sort of enter the holiday season, which is the shopping season for eBay. So there's lots of kind of manual work going on by our engineers. And of course, I want our engineers to be spending all their time having fun writing code. And so the punchline is, it's time for a new search engine. It's time to kind of turn the page and build a modern world-class search engine. And that is where Cassini comes in. Um, we're a pretty imaginative bunch, us engineers, so we decided, well, we'll name it after a satellite. We did that once before, let's do it again. So we picked a more recent satellite. Uh, Cassini was launched, I think, in 1996. Um, you know, modern, wonderful satellite. Um, the only secret that I'll tell you about Cassini is it's stuck in orbit going around Saturn, but we'll, we'll, we'll pretend we don't know that. Um, it is undoubtedly, this project, the most ambitious um, engineering undertaking that, that, that eBay has, has made in a, in a, in a long time. Um, there are uh, well over 100 engineers working on this project full time. Um, they're working on four tracks. There's an automation track around making running the system um, software driven on commodity hardware. Um, there's the search back end track, the actual rewrite of the search engine it itself. There's a search science track where we're thinking about all the factors that should be used in ranking and how they'll work on top of a modern platform. And then there's a search front end track where we're rebuilding the user experience that, that sits on top of search. So four large tracks all running in parallel. You can, you can imagine the, the, the complexities of managing a project at that scale. Um, it'll be complete in less than 18 months, hence, the, hence the, 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 the tag of it being a very, very ambitious project. And it will be a platform for ranking innovation. It will be, it will be something that really takes the customer experience forward at, at eBay in a, in a very, very significant way when we launch it. Um, right now, uh, we're beginning tests. Uh, I talked a little bit yesterday on the, on the panel about uh, testing at eBay. Um, and as I said yesterday, if you, if you do use eBay, the chances are you are in at least one test, perhaps many tests. Um, and Cassini is one of the things that we're, we're beginning to test and understand. Um, of course, we won't release Cassini unless it's a great experience for customers, and that will take iteration. It's a, it's a very significant piece of software and a very new piece of software. But I think it's very likely that we'll launch Cassini um, this year, but we'll only do that when, uh, when it's a great experience for our customers. So really exciting times, some really, really challenging stuff going on um, in, in, in Project Cassini. Uh, let me tell you about another platform. Um, I'm going to tell you about two of them. Um, and maybe some of you have heard of, uh, heard of this project. Um, we've, uh, we, we've recently open sourced it. Um, it's a thing called QLIO. Um, 
So, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of context. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked with, with eBay's APIs. Um, yeah, not fun? No. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, when I first got to eBay, I spent, uh, I spent a week with a, with a buddy of mine trying to build a PHP application on top of eBay's APIs, and I didn't have fun either. Um, it's, it's pretty challenging. Um, I think if my memory's right, we have over 20 APIs, and they're all really different. And so things that work on, on one API don't quite work on another API. Documentation's a little spotty. It's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's challenging to work with. Um, what's, what's also challenging is as a, as, a, as a developer, as a PHP developer, you, you find yourself making calls to lots of different APIs in a single script and then sort of you know, working with the data, massaging it to create the single result that you need. So you tend to make a lot of HTTP requests and get a lot of responses. Um, to, carry out any, to carry out any one task. So we released this thing, QLIO. I'll explain a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, and it, its its goal in life is to make using our APIs very, very simple. Um, and it makes it simple in two ways. It shortens your code. It, uh, it, it helps you make one call rather than many calls. Um, uh, and it also leaves most of the sort of back-end work to servers that are hosted by us, so you don't have to worry about sort of all the details. The details are much more abstracted than in our, than in our current uh, APIs. So let me give you an example. Um, so let's suppose you and I, we're working together, and we're working on a PHP project, and we're, gonna, we're building some sort of console thing um, that's going to allow large business sellers to better manage their inventory on eBay and we're going to build that on top of uh, eBay's APIs. Let's pretend that one of the modules that we're writing is, uh, is a module that's going to find uh, all the items that match a query. Um, it's going to find the best offers that have made made for those items by buyers. Um, it's going to find the bidders that made those best offers, and then it's going to sort of collapse all that and return a, a JSON response. So let's imagine we wanted to write that script. Um, we did, and here it is. So here's, here's page one of the script. Uh, working with our, with our current APIs. Uh, I'll share the code out with you guys if you're interested. Uh, here's page two of the script. Um, you know, making the call to the, the, the second uh, API that's needed for this task. Uh, here's page three. Um, here's page four. And here finally is page five um, to, to carry out that task. So 180 lines of code. Um, just to find the items, get their details, get the best offers, and get their bidders, and wrap it all up as a JSON response. So lots and lots of work. Let me show you the QLIO version of that. So 14 lines of code. Um, really, really fantastic. What we've built is, is a way uh, in a, an SQL-like language that you can express uh, a complex information need that may require uh, access to many of our APIs. So if you're, if you're sort of comfortable working in SQL, you can sort of glance at this and you can see that you know, we're finding information about the items and then we're finding information about the offers for those items based on the set of items that were returned, um, finding information about the bidders for the set of offers that were returned, um, and then we're sort of packaging it up as a, as a JSON response and, and returning it. And what's really, really nice here is that um, it's, it's callable using a, a, get, a single GET request. So you can go to ql.io slash item details slash a query. In fact, you can try that now if you've got a, if you've got a web connection. So ql.io slash item details slash Ferrari, you can try. And you'll see you'll get a JSON response back um, that, that's running this little script. Um, if you go to QLIO, you can, you can write your own scripts, you can kind of play around, there's lots of examples there, and you can have those hosted on the QLIO site. Um, so then as a PHP developer, you can make a single GET request to this QLIO URL, you can get back the JSON response and work with the JSON response. So really simple, hosted by us, um, much less complex, abstracts all the unnecessary details, and best of all, you get to make one HTTP GET request and get one HTTP response. So really, really cool. Uh, and I hope you find it, hope you find it useful. Um, just some, some stats on it. Um, we tried writing this code in Java. That's the red bar up here on the left. It took uh, over 300 lines of Java to uh, work with our APIs. As I said, the PHP version, about 180 lines of code. 
Uh, the nice little green bar is the 14 lines of QLIO. Um, you can see the amount of data that's moved around over there on the right. Um, so before QLIO, uh, you know, lots of data moved around, lots of HTTP requests. Uh, with QLIO, you know, much less data moved around. And that's sort of pictorially represented down here as well. So you can see lots and lots of requests being made by our original PHP script. You know, just the one request um, if you access the QLIO um, uh, URL. So really, really nice. I hope you find it useful. Um, I think it, I think it's a, I think it's the, the the way of the future, and I and I hope that uh, lots of companies uh, head in this direction. I think I think we'd all find it useful as, as PHP developers. If you want to learn more about it, httpql.io. Um, it's on the GitHub. It's been open sourced. We're certainly as a company pushing to open source a lot more of what we do. Um, we're becoming committers for major projects. We're adopting more projects internally and working hard to to become a much more uh, much more uh, open source friendly company. So enjoy, hope you find that useful. All right. So let me race through uh, one last topic and that is sort of you know where to for uh, e-commerce and eBay um, next. I've given you that tour of data and I've given you a quick tour of, of the platforms. Um, I would argue that right now, today, we are at an inflection point uh, in shopping. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting time um, to be working on commerce online. And I'm, I'm very, very confident there's going to be more change in the next year or two in commerce than there's probably been in the last 10 or 15 years. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very, very exciting time. Why is it exciting? Well, I think, I think it's exciting for many reasons, but one is that there's a, there's a, there's a convergence going on between online and offline shopping. Um, and I'm sure you're all part of it. I'm sure that when you're in a bricks and mortar store, you're, you're, you're thinking about buying a, a, a GPS or a phone, you're, you're looking at that device, I'm sure you're, you're making that decision with, with some sort of device in your hand. You're saying, hmm, let me read some reviews. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll text a friend. Um, maybe I'll, I'll post something to Facebook or Twitter. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things going on. I'll do, some, I'll do some price comparison. I'll scan the barcode with, with red laser. Let me see what other offers are around me. Um, in fact, let me check what other stores are nearby. I might, go and, I might go and check those out as well. And in fact, this price isn't so great. Let me just buy it online after all and pay for some shipping. I mean, I'm sure you are, I'm sure you are all at that, at that really, really, uh, you're, you're at that convergence of offline and online. And I think that opens up a, 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 a wonderful array of possibilities for those who are working on commerce. I'm sure that, that those of you who are entrepreneurial and, and, and listening are thinking, hey, I've got an idea. I've got an idea of something I could do in that space that would be great for customers that helps the, the offline world and the online world converge. Um, so very, very interesting times. And looks like your phone is ringing. <laughs> Somebody excited about convergence of commerce. Um, and here's some data to kind of back it up, I suppose, that this, that this, that this amazing trend is happening. Um, so if you look back at 2008, um, online commerce was worth around $325 billion, according to Forrester. And it was only 4% of commerce. 96% you know, of commerce was still offline. Um, if you jump forward to today, and you, you compute those statistics, yes, the online has grown from 4% to 6%, but most excitingly, web-influenced offline is now 37%. And so there's 6% that's pure online, and there's 37% that's offline but has some online component. There's people making use of something online in order to carry out that offline piece. Forrester also says that in 2013, this, this convergence of online and offline commerce is going to be a, a market that's worth about uh, 10 trillion US dollars compared to 2008 where it was only 325 billion. So perhaps that backs up my, 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 my speculation that there's going to be you know, a lot of change in the next two years relative to that last um, 10 or 15. And I think we 
sort of tying this all together, I think, I think as, 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 as people in this space, we need to be very, very aware that it, this is a consumer-led revolution. You know, this is, this is customers deciding to do things different ways. Um, this is customers giving us data that we need to understand in the ways I've talked about earlier so that we can push commerce forward to help those customers. And it's very much technology enabled. I mean, it is moving online, and so it is, it is moving in the direction of technology. So it's all about the customer, it's very customer centric, it's very data centric, and it's moving online. So it's a really, really interesting time. Um, I'm pretty excited about eBay, I should say. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting company to be at right now. Um, you probably know something about x.commerce, they acquired Magento, which I'm sure many of you have worked with. It's a, it's a well-known sort of PHP um, suite that's used for building um, small uh, online experiences. Um, so that's part of eBay. We've also uh, acquired GSI Commerce, which is a much like larger player in, in, that, in that same space. They power, they power folks like Toys R Us, a big, the big US uh, uh, children's toys uh, retailer. They power the, uh, the National Football League in the States, uh, Major League Baseball. So they're the, sort of the, the engine that's sitting under those guys, and they do everything from the online presence right through to the fulfillment in the warehouses. So we've kind of got x.commerce kind of covering the, 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 the smaller emergence of, 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 of smaller retailers onto the web, and then GSI um, are looking after the, the larger providers. And then, of course, sitting alongside that, you've got PayPal, you know, the world's largest payments provider. And then I'm very excited to be part of the marketplaces business, which is all about connecting buyers and sellers. So I think it's a very interesting suite of, of, of things that eBay uh, Inc. does. And I think it sets us up um, to enable consumers really to buy uh, anything, anywhere, anyhow. So really, really interesting times. So with that, I will stop talking. And thank you. Um, what, I, what I'll also say is we're hiring. So if you are interested in uh, uh, working in California um, with folks like me, uh, you can send me an email. Uh, hugh.williams at ebay.com. I would love to hear from you. Um, and I think we have maybe, I think I've sped, I've sped enough that we have a, a few minutes for questions if, you, uh, if you'd like to, to ask any. Um, yeah, I was kind of wondering how you're finding working with Node for QL.io. Sorry? Um, how are you finding Node for QL? <coughs> Sorry, how are you finding Node for QL.io? How are we and finding it? How you kind of set up whether you use cluster or, or how you sort of route it across all the different processes? Um, I, uh, to be really honest with you, I'm probably not the right guy to give you the, 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 the detailed answers to how QLIO works. Um, um, but certainly it's um, the, 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 the guy who built it, um, uh, Subu, is um, a very, very big fan of uh, Node.js um, and uh, a very strong advocate for it in the company. I know in most of the talks that uh, that he gives right now, he, uh, he says we only had one, one you know, node uh, uh, zealot back in um, 2009 and now there's you know, tens of us who are, who are zealots and it's taking over the, over the company, uh, so he's, he's very, very excited about it. But I can't tell you the, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the details. Uh, what methodology are you, you using for Cassini? Are you using Agile or wa Waterfall or how are you managing the, the product? Um, so... Um, again, sort of going back to the, the, the panel yesterday, if, 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 you, if you were uh, here, um, you know, I have a very strong belief as, a, as an engineering um, leader that we should empower small teams to run in the way they want to run and have clear ownership over the things they want to run. Um, so I tend to push those decisions right down to the bottom of the organisation to be made by the teams that actually build the software. Um, so there's no, no sort of prescription coming from me. Um, but I think in some cases folks would like more prescription from me, but I really do believe about believe in empowering engineers and, and the line level leaders who run those teams. What I, what I can tell you is that the search back end team, who are sort of the, the infrastructure team, have made a very profound shift from a sort of waterfall model of a couple of years ago to a, a very um, careful adoption of Agile Scrum. Um, so they certainly don't do that sort of Scrum butt thing that lots of lots of teams do. It's a it's a you know a really careful application of, uh, of Scrum, and they're very proud of their burn down charts and um, the, the, the way they do their Scrum planning and um, the way they, um, uh, they post-mortem the, the, the sprints that they've had, um, those kinds of things. So they've been uh, very zealous in their adoption of it. Um, I think if I look at the search front end team, I'd say it's probably a little bit more um, 
seat of the pants scrum, um, um, which I think is a little more, probably a little bit more appropriate as you get sort of closer to the customer, you know, where it's, it's easier to, you know, put together, a, you know, a simple user experience and try it out and then say, hey, we want to we wanna do something different where it's a, easy, a little easier to be a bit more agile with the, with the requirements. Um, the search science team, um, uh, you know, don't, don't really have a, a methodology per se that they adopt. I mean, they do very little software engineering. It's much more about sort of digging in data and experimentation. I'd say what they have is a very sort of fast fail philosophy. Um, so they try and let, you know, a thousand ideas bloom and then, you know, very quickly, um, you know, chop off the ideas that aren't working and, and invest in the ideas that they are. So they have very much a sort of portfolio experimental approach. Um, and the team that's working on automation, again, is a, is a, is a sort of a, um, a strong adopter of, of Agile Scrum. Um, and that's a, that's a very, very complex project. Um, so a little, you know, different philosophies. I think, you know, one of the, one of the challenges, of course, if, you, is if you're, you're pushing those decisions right down to the bottom of the organisation as to, you know, who does what. And sometimes the teams have trouble coordinating because they think differently. Um, so it, it definitely creates some overhead for guys like me to kind of work, you know, bring those teams together and get them to work together effectively. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of up for that if the, uh, if the engineers and the teams are sort of happy with the methodologies that they're using. Hmm. Great question, thanks. Um, <coughs> sorry, you mentioned earlier about the conversion as of the online and the offline, and I was just wondering what you saw eBay's role in that was. Um, so I think, I think our, our role um, is, is very broad, um, and, I, and I can't... Um, you know, precisely say what it is we will do or presuppose what we will do. But I think if you've got kind of the world's leading platform for bringing uh, bricks and mortar stores online, um, you've got the eBay marketplace and you've got the, the, the PayPal payments engine, I think you've got an enormous kind of aperture of, 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 things, that you can, of things that you can do. Um, you know, on the, on the one hand, you can provide people with trusted identity um, so that they can have trusted experiences on the web. Um, on the other hand, you've got, you've got a, a marketplace with, uh, you know, 100 million active customers, um, and so you can, you can help, you can perhaps help retailers um, get their inventory out to, to more, more buyers than they've ever dreamed of getting it out to before. Um, and you've got kind of tools, and you've got developers building on top of those tools. So I, I, I don't know exactly where it'll go, but what, I, what, I, what I'll, I'll, I'll say again is what I said before, is I think it's, this time around it's very, very consumer-led. Um, I, think, I think what we, what we all need to do is sort of understand how customers want to shop and what they're doing and then, and then make, that, make that easier. Um, and of course there'll be sparks of innovation along the way that are disruptive, so things like red laser. Um, but, I, but I think this time around, it's very much about looking at the data and understanding what customers want to do. Um, but I think in two years' time, we'll look back and say, wow, you know, that, that wasn't what we expected. <laughs> you know, the world, is, the world is really different now. Um, I think it's going to be a really exciting ride. Um, yeah, I was interested that uh, eBay took over GSI Commerce because they seem to have completely different ways of developing software apart from anything else. Um, um, is eBay going to reform GSI Commerce or are you going to let them carry on going their own way? Um, so I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to confess to, to um, um, you know some some ignorance around the details of how of how GSI does its development and and then how it how it runs. Um, but I think again as a as a company, I think we're very respectful of you know teams having their own cultures and their own ways of doing things. I think it you know from from the top we we sort of don't push down process or uh, particular ways of doing things. I think at the at the top of the company, um, you know our leaders talk more about sort of goals and strategy and a vision and aspiration. And I think at the bottom of the company, we can kind of rally around that and, and you know, and, and push up what it is we should do to, to, to meet those goals and that, those aspirations. Um, so I think um, I, I can't imagine any sort of, you know, heavy-handed, um, you know, pushing of GSI to do things in a, in a, in a particular way. What I, can, what I can instead imagine is that, you know, GSI will make use of all the wonderful data that we've got and the experiences that we have and the tools that are available to, to take themselves to the next level. 
I wanted to ask a question about the future of the actual product itself. Um, in Magento, you can like bespoke the products, and I think it was on the cover of Time magazine that more and more products were being personalised. I was wondering if eBay was seeing that trend coming through in the in the marketplace, and are you doing anything to support that going forward? Yeah, per personalization is really really interesting. I think it's a very very challenging problem, um, but I think I think uh, you know everybody in commerce needs to be moving in that direction. Um, you probably saw that we recently did an acquisition of Hunch.com, um, who's sort of well known for some taste graph technology that they had. So um, you, can, you can play with Hunch.com if you're interested. Um, and they have some really interesting technology around sort of you answering questions and then predicting things that you will like. Um, so we recently acquired those guys. They're, 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 they're really expert in sort of understanding customers and mapping customers' behaviors to, to tastes that the customers have. Um, and we're really excited about using that technology um, across eBay. Um, we've also invested really deeply in, in recommendations. Um, so, you know, when a, when a user um, interacts with an item or purchases an item, uh, we're trying very hard to, to suggest other items that they may be interested in and to engage the user more on the homepage when they come back and they're looking for, you know, looking to be inspired by, by a shopping experience. Um, so sort of edging in that direction. I think it's going to be very hard, and it's, I think it's very hard for everybody to really get to the point where uh, online shopping is truly personalised. Uh, I think there's a, there's a ton of challenges there. You know, I've had experiences uh, online where, uh, you know, I've made a purchase, for example, for a, for a friend. You know, so let's, let's imagine a situation where, you know, a, friend, a good friend of mine's just had a, had a new child and I've decided I must buy them a gift. And I go and buy this, I buy this gift and, you know, I give it to them. And then from then on, the system's recommending all sorts of children things to me. But that, that intent for me is finished. You know, I'm kind of done. And I think knowing when intents are kind of continuing and are underlying themes and knowing when intents are kind of one-off, um, is a really, really challenging problem. So I think there's a lot of barriers to really making personalization work incredibly effectively uh, online, but I think everybody needs to, uh, you know, needs to be aspiring to make progress in that direction and make the, the buyer's experience as, as, as custom and as tailored and as personal as, as it can possibly be. It's been a lot of fun, by the way. It's great to see you guys. Hey, I've got a picture for you too. Um, snuck it in. This is one of our data centers in, uh, in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. It's pretty cool. And, uh, and this is, these are the machines inside it. Um, so these are actually the Cassini machines. Um, so you can see uh, you know, racks, of, racks, racks of servers. The, the data center is super, super cool. Um, we're really proud of it. It's, um, it's one of the greenest data centers ever built. It's got you know, amazing uh, engineering innovation in, uh, in cooling and, and power use. Um, so really, really, really cool stuff. Um, I just wonder, what were your plans for Magento and, and why was it that you purchased that? Because obviously that's considerably smaller than uh, eBay.com. So, w like, what what is the purpose of, of purchasing Magento? What are you expecting to do with the Magento platform? Yeah, so I think I think if you go back to what eBay um, Inc is fundamentally about, you know, we're fundamentally about connecting buyers and sellers in the way they want to be connected. I think that's really you know what's at the heart of the company, and I think we're very you know we, we want it, we want to position ourselves as a as a company that helps make that happen. Um, and you know we want to be part of this this revolution that's going to take place. And so I think I think with that context, you know, acquiring Magento made a ton of sense. Um, you know, I think it, it really brings to the portfolio of things we do. You know, another important way to connect buyers and sellers. And and, a, and I think it fits really nicely with eBay marketplaces, with with GSI and with PayPal. So I think it's a it's a really nice fit in in, in the family for us. Okay, I've uh, just got one tiny little question actually. Um, could you get the slide back with a heat map? Can you, can you get oh that my bit? goodness! Uh, yes, I can probably do that. This could take a while. Well, why don't you just ask me the question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, well, you had a load of percentage, like one point one percent clicks here, not point nine seven percent clicks. Yeah. Um, the numbers didn't add, add up to a hundred. Ah, yes. Um, so you're not seeing you're not seeing lots of the lots of the clicks that go on. So things like the pagination control have you know have have significant numbers. Um, and what you're also not seeing is the percentage of time that the page is abandoned. Um, so it's a percentage of but that, that would count as a failed search, presumably. That's right, one of the, the, most, the most important. Yeah, so if, uh, if the sum if the sum is significantly less than one hundred percent, then there's there's probably an issue going on. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Thank you.